throw myself up a chair over here.
And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thou shalt say thus unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, This shall you say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. That is the memorial we must think of. Jesus Christ sent by the Father for us. Give us salvation. 
we have the opportunity, we have the opportunity to talk to many people, and this is one of the things that he has given us to do. It's, it's up to us. We need to do this. So, Father, in Jesus' name, as we come into the service today, I pray, Lord, that your light might shine great. I pray, Father, that the music will be sweet and beautiful. I pray that the words that come forth will entice people and show people, lead them to Jesus. And I pray many souls will be saved, many souls will be changed. And I pray today, as we go out from this place, that we'll remember Memorial Day is not just for us to have fun. Memorial Day is to remember that God has given us life, and His life is in through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, God. Why don't you guys stand? The, uh, the, the Lord is coming back for a purified bride, His church, and uh, we do. We want to be ready. Amen. Okay, so let's sing about that today.
even with scars, Lord, you make it stronger and better than new. So God, we ask that you just continue to do your work today. That you take broken vessels and you bring life. Call out dead hearts and you bring life. You call dry bones together and bring life. truth today. Your truth is the truth. It's the only truth. There's no individual truths. It's only your truth. It is you. It is who you are. You designed it. You are truth. So God, we thank you for that. We thank you for us. It being foundational, never changing, unshakable, John 15, 13, uh, from the Passion Translation to you. For the greatest love of all is a love that sacrifices all. And this great love is demonstrated when a person sacrifices his life for his friends. As we pray, I want you all to join with us in prayer. Okay, this is, we're not observers. I want you to enter in as we seek the Lord today. Heavenly Father, Today we pause to remember and give honor to those in the military who have courageously laid down their lives for our freedom. These men and women gave the most precious gift they had for us, the very life breath that you breathed into them. May they inspire us to do our part to live sacrificial lives and to uphold the freedoms that we've gained in this great nation. We ask that your Holy Spirit would comfort, strengthen, and give peace to the families and friends of our fallen heroes as their loss is grieved. Sure. 
we were upstairs and the Holy Spirit had laid it on my heart to pray for those that were suffering from post traumatic syndrome and their families. So if you guys want to please join with me and lift them up to the Lord. Father, we just come in the name of Jesus. I pray we just souls to you, Father. You know what they've seen, what they've seen, what they've been through, Father. And I just ask that you would heal their hearts and Heal their souls and their minds right now in the name of Jesus. And just bless their families abundantly, Lord. Just pour out your spirit on them. Let them receive a blessing that cannot be contained, Lord. And when they receive healing, let them go out and be the instrument of healing to others, Father. And I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you just put on my heart this morning that, you know, we've lost a lot. People have given it all, and, uh, and I want to personally thank any of our military, retired, current, I thank you guys for your service, but Lord, I just ask that you, we've lost a lot, but we're still losing them, Lord. We, we're losing them every day from suicide, Lord, and I pray that, that you will intervene in their lives, that you will introduce yourself to them, you will put people in their lives so that they can see you and feel your love, Lord and not take their own life, Lord. I just come against that so strongly, Lord. It is such a tragedy in this nation. These men and women give so much to our country just to come home and to give it all under their own hands, Lord. And I just, I pray for them. I pray for their families. I pray for the ones we've already lost, but I pray for the ones that we haven't lost. Lord, I just ask for you to intervene in your mighty name, I pray. As we were praying upstairs, I was just feeling that um, the Lord wanted us to pray for those wounds in the heart um, of our past soldiers, the present ones, Lord. Um, any wounds or hurts in the hearts, God, we know that you are the healer, the one that can heal those wounds that maybe aren't even spoken for. And I just pray, God, that you will give give those suffering open hearts and open hands, Lord, to lay those wounds and those injuries at your feet, God, and allow you to do the healing that only you can do, Lord. We just pray, God, that you will cover them with, with your love and with your healing hands, Jesus, and that they will feel the presence of the Holy Spirit so strong in their lives, God. And I just pray for strength for them to turn it all over to you, Lord, and let that healing process be in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Thank you guys so much for leading into that with us with our house of prayer. So these are moments that we want to bring to the Lord and uh, together, collectively, corporately together. And I uh, appreciate you leaning in with that. Leading into that with us. Um, thank you very much. All right. Can we, uh, man, just thank our our team this morning. Can you just give them a round of applause? Thank you just for the good luck team. Our team. If you want, sorry. If you want, if you 
If you show up at 57, they may not welcome you anymore. 51, 53, or 55. Yeah. Um, So uh, 
uh, big topic. So, um, well, the word repentance is not usually a word that makes it into our everyday vocabulary, right? Especially in our culture today. And one, it's generally seen as a kind of a churchy term used in Christianity in the Bible. Two, if we know what it generally means, it's not something that we like to hear about. It, you know, I personally see repentance as freedom, as uncomfortable as it can be to do a 180 in who we were to who we are now, as uncomfortable it is to admit those things, repentance is freedom. Because we might think we might and wrapped up in our own sin and wrapped up into who we are, we're going to see repentance as kind of something that's changing our mojo. You know, I mean, I kind of like what I do. But what he's trying to call us out of is the bondage that we're in. You're in shackles and you don't know it if you're just sitting in and enjoying it without repentance. Okay? So we want to break the shackles off, all right? Um, and, you know, and you know what gives the word repentance, I think, such a bad rap is the humility it actually takes to admit that we're wrong when we do something. I mean, that's, that's the hard part. You know, in a culture that feeds us lines in every single commercial about what we need to do to be happy or have it your way, <laughs> or impossible to just do it because your flesh is craving it. You know, this idea of repentance and humility is so very countercultural. We don't like to admit the presence of pride in our mindset. And that really gets to how we believe deep down. And it might be, it might be subtle or it could be as obvious as, you know, God doesn't get to determine who I am. I determine who I am. My gender, my personality. I don't care what God says. Now, most of us kind of like, ooh, Paul, oh, that is uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, most of us, if we actually verbalize it that way, we're going, man, I don't, I don't really think that. But, and it's, it is the antithesis of humility. But I think if we actually understand what pride is, then we find that place like, no, I kind of do that in the way I respond to things. Now, let's go to James chapter 4, verse 6. Why is pride such a big deal? Well, it says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I'll let you decide what line you want to be in, all right? <laughs> but some of us that own, and some of us that own these mindsets might not even want to admit that we're in opposition to God. However, the very presence of not wanting to admit it, it kind of proves the point, right? Now, we really don't want to find ourselves opposing God. I mean, it's, it's not, it's, that's not where we want to be. But somehow we find ourselves in that from time to time when we are really struggling with that something that the flesh really wants or craves, right? Our flesh is really good at creating justifications for what it really wants. I mean, I'm just being very transparent. You know, I'm going back for a dessert that I really don't need. And all my wife has to do is say, hey, do you really need that? You know, and my responses are all justifications, right? They're all variations of, you know, how much do I really need it? I probably don't really need it, but I want it, right? That's where we live in most cases, right? I can't really claim that I'm watching what I eat while I'm knocking down two bowls of ice cream, all right? I'm just going to be straight up honest. Be transparent with you today, right? But, you know, I, I do find, well, apparently I do, I am watching what I eat. I just watch it from the plate to the mouth. Right, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I can deceive myself in those moments. So when I go and share what we're sharing today, 
I'm in the same line you are. I'm trying to, I'm trying to die to self to that too. Okay? So now what about so that's, that's, that's food, it's blood, it's all those things we're all trying. Any of us has been on any kind of diet, blah, 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 right? What about relationships? We can desire relationship to just be with somebody so badly that we are willing to blow through all of the Holy Spirit red flags, right? To the point that we end up spun out emotionally and hurting, and we didn't have to be. You know, some of these choices can affect us for so many years. The enemy uses these opportunities from time to time to really lure us into a corner. And usually, especially in the area of relationships, rejection has the voice, right? Rejection can be the loudest voice. It's usually... The loudest voice in our internal, I call it, I've heard it, you know, Christian call it, I like it, it's quite a bit, head trash. It's our head trash, <laughs> right? Um, our internal head trash. Rejection can be the loudest voice in the trash can, if you will. <laughs> Rejection almost sounds like the equivalent of a three-year-old pitching a fit in our head and not getting what he or she wants. I mean, we continue to proceed in a relationship we know is not going to end well. And we've heard the Spirit tell us, hey, watch out. And it's usually quiet, right? It's usually quiet. He's not going, hey, don't do that, Paul. I mean, I really wish you would do that tonight, right? <laughs> Speak that loudly. But he's that quiet voice, right? He's like, hey, watch out. And then we've got our own peeps that God has so graciously placed in our lives that love us. And they're saying, hey, watch out. But somehow in our head, the fear of rejection is justifying and blurring the lines and telling us to keep going. It's going to be all right. Yeah. We have convinced ourselves that the little relational crumbs that we are getting from this person is enough. <laughs> All right. The flesh is louder than the Spirit's voice sometimes. And we know deep down. We know deep down it isn't right. But our flesh really wants it. Because the enemy's dangling the care of feeling wanted. And it's greater than the trust that God, our perfect Father, can provide for our every need. Every need. Even a healthy relationship. We can do that. See, as a believer, as a believer, we know the Sunday school answer in our head, but our belief and trust in that moment is listening to our flesh scream of fear of being rejected and telling God how much we are entitled to have this relationship. You ever done that before? Holy Spirit is quietly saying, hey, you can trust me. You can trust me with this area too, you know. You see, self-deception can happen in any corner of our mind. And it's our flesh that ends up speaking louder when we are deceived by ourselves. So what about other areas like our identity? I mean, did God make a mistake at birth in how he made you? Yet our flesh feels so entitled to declare to the God of heaven and earth that somehow we know ourselves better than he does. Our flesh and its cravings become the louder voice, and if we're not grounded in the truth of God's word, our flesh has the capability to lead us into some dark places where the Holy Spirit's voice gets harder and harder harder to hear because our flesh is yelling so loudly. Let's go to Galatians 6 verses 7 and 8. It says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will 
from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows through the Spirit will, from the Spirit, reap eternal life. So which one are we sowing more into? Flesh or Spirit? What is our day made up of? Now, if you go around, whether you're heterosexual or homosexual, and have acted on every flesh craving, you will equally explode your life. Doesn't matter who you are. If you lied every time you tried to say thanks, if you gave in to every, every covetous thought by stealing what you didn't have just because your flesh was the louder voice, then yes, there would be earthly consequences, but even more importantly, there would be spiritual consequences because of what you have sown into. Most of us would probably agree that we're not actually trying to do them on purpose. But our flesh finds a way to deceive us and to do it. The enemy uses sin to lure us into a choice to sin, which then leads to more choices to sin, which allows the flesh to become the driver of our choices. That's the dangerous part. You know, we've given, we've given our flesh the driver's seat. As long as he's not in the driver's seat, then you know, we can navigate and we can come back submitted to the Lord. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm a heart of repentance, right? That's kind of where we start. If we have a heart of repentance, the flesh is not in the driver's seat. We might have flesh moments, sure, but we acknowledge and repent. You will recognize that's where you are in the flesh because you have no true peace within you. If you've ever walked in some sin, if you walked in that journey for any length of time, you just, man, it's just not, you don't ever find true peace. You might have moments of, okay, I agree just a little bit, but then maybe something else, whether it, it, it's stirred up, there's just no peace. There's no rest in it, or in, in, the, in the sin itself. And I'll say this, it's my, anyway. Peace is not surrounding yourself with people that tell you your sin is okay. Yes. Amen. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm sorry. That's false peace, and you are deceiving yourself. You know, in the same token, God's peace is not having religious people tell you how condemned you are. Because that's not who you are. In Christ, he says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So if we're here in the religious spirit of condemnation, then that's not him either. Yes. Sharing the truth in love is giving us space to hear the truth in love and respond. The peace of God is what is absent when you are in the middle of the enemy's deception or your own. The enemy's power over us, especially as believers, is only what we abdicate or give up to him. I want you to know that today. If Jesus has already paid for it on the cross, he's already defeated the enemy. He holds the key to death, hell, and the grave. It's done. He even said it on the cross. It is finished. What was finished? Well, the payment of sin is done. In Christ, man, we have already won it. God's not fighting the enemy. He's our adversary. Why? Because he's trying to lure us away from that victory. Let's look at Romans 8, 37. No, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He has equipped us to walk in victory over the enemy's power and over sin's power. However, if we don't use it, then we've just simply abdicated that power and we'll be attacked. And not using God's power means that we are allowing the flesh voice in us to be the loudest voice in deceiving ourselves. That somehow the enemy knows something that we don't. 
So today's sermon title is A Trickster of Myself. You see, self-deception is as real as the enemy's deception. And so I want to dive into two thoughts today. We kind of touched on one of them. Yes, the enemy only has power that is given to him by us and our choosing to sin. I mean, he, he doesn't have all this stuff that we think he does. And two, in many cases, the enemy is not the one deceiving us. Many times it's simply ourselves. I don't want to give the enemy more credit than he deserves, okay? He's good at it, no doubt. That's his mojo, his deception. But not everything is the enemy. Sometimes we just got some stinking thinking, all right? So sin, the word sin, it's an archery term, translates missing the mark. So when you're shooting at a target, the bullseye is the mark, right? Anything outside of that, even if ever so slightly off, or just incredibly off, you just like, <laughs> shot in the air, all right? You're still off, right? And you can be a little bit off, and it's still off. Okay? That's sin. Doesn't matter if it's just a little off, or it's way out there, right? Doesn't matter if you shot it just a couple of circles off or out into the woods. You just didn't even hit the You weren't even aiming in the right direction, right? It's all still sin. Against the perfect and holy God, we as mankind all miss the mark because of our sin nature. We all need a Savior. This is why Jesus came to make up for us missing the mark. James 4, 17 says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. 1 John 1, 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is why repentance is so important. Mark 7, Jesus' words, it says, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile the person. If you ever hear somebody tell you and give you the advice, just follow your heart. I mean, I shouldn't have said that. I've always said, just kick them in the teeth. Don't do that, okay? It was just, it's like any moment. Sorry. Like, yes, no. Right? You just say, no, I'm not going to do that. Because our heart, our, our, our hearts are deceitfully wicked. Because, because our flesh and our emotions and our soul, soulish responses, if they're not governed by the Spirit, then they're going to give us anything. We've just been talking about how we ourselves can be deceived by our own heart. And I think we can all agree that on our humanness and our imperfect, imperfection. I don't, mean, I don't think anybody in the house today would raise their hand and go, hey, Paul, what if you're perfect? No, I, don't, I haven't seen that yet, so that's good. <laughs> so I think we're all teachable here. I mean, even if we tried to be good people, we've still broken at least one of the Ten Commandments. You know, it's, even if we, you know, even if it's just one, God said we, we've broken them all if we've broken them all. And this list in Mark 7 is pretty extensive and probably gets all of us with one or two at least, if not more. So it's hard to disagree that if a perfect and holy God had a requirement of perfection to get to heaven, none of us are going to make it on our own merit, Okay? We need Jesus. I, I, I was having a passion play yesterday. So I saw a couple of people out of that y'all need Jesus t-shirt. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, we, we all need Jesus, right? <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. I mean, just as Jesus is a very real Savior for us to have a relationship with, a very real God in heaven, we have a very real 
opposing adversary that John 10, 10 says has come to kill, to steal, and destroy us. That's important to know. If that's our adversary's goal, then we probably need to understand how we operate. Well, deception is his calling card. Getting us to believe something other than the truth. I mean, isn't this how it started for himself as Lucifer in heaven, right? In the pride of wanting to be like God or as powerful as God in the garden. When he was telling Eve, you know, hey, God didn't want you to know this because you're going to be like him. They all, in, in each of those, those cases, what is the enemy's tactic? He tries to get you to own something that God's already spoken about. Right? He tries to get us to see, think that we didn't have something that we already have. I mean, Adam and Eve had full access to God. What do you need? But somehow Satan convinces us that somehow we're lacking. This is what he does. It's called deception. Sin is what the enemy uses to lure us away from our faith in God, to get us so deceived and deep into choosing a sin or a lifestyle of sin, which is called lawlessness in the Word, that we would choose to renounce our faith because we desire the lifestyle of sin more than belief, surrender, and trust in God. Satan, our adversary, doesn't create anything new. I think we need to understand that. He only produces counterfeits of fakes to the real thing. Have you ever noticed that? And this, they put back on your mud sheet. All right, here we go. He produces counterfeits to acceptance and community. Like, have you ever had, I'm not asking you to raise your hand or that. Drinking buddies. They were on the buddies because you were drinking, right? I mean, when you stop drinking, they're like, dude, I, you know, they don't hang out with you anymore, right? Like, where are those people today? Drug buddies, the same way. You stop doing drugs, they're no longer around. Here we go. The other counterfeit to community acceptance is the LGBTQ community. Now here, and this is this is with love I'm saying this, all right? Because we are all in this together. Because the enemy loves to deceive. So if he can deceive us into thinking that we are experiencing real community, when in actuality we're just, we're just surrounded by people that agree with our own sin because they're in it too, then. We've got this false sense of community. We've got this false sense of like everything's okay. When he's been very clear about what's not okay. And I'll say this. Religion does the same thing. Okay? I mean, let's get everybody while we're at it. Okay? I mean, we can have, we can gather in religious ways that the heart of God is not ever in. Because it's all about religion. It's about behavior. It's about all these different things, all these rules. And it's not about the grace of God. It's not about his love. It's not about what he longs to do through us and in us. Religion can be just as dark. To be real. The enemy produces counterfeits through relationships that are not built on the selfless, sacrificial love of Christ. They're built on self-gratification. What can I get out of them? I mean, this is why our culture is just so terrible at true, meaningful relationships. <laughs> we all come in with this self as the top priority. Jesus gave us the true example of sacrificial love. Marriage only works when both of you are dead to yourself. And believe me, I'm trying to revive that old guy over here. Danielle does not let me. I'm just saying, like, no, hey, 
Uh, you've been around a lot, none of those. He probably does that, right? I mean, we're both in that boat when our old selves try to rear our head and we try to change the other one or the other one needs to, and you, you know, you might even look at yourself, man, you need Jesus right now. You know what I mean? And, you know, pray. Don't do that. All right? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I mean, we all can come into relationships with self as the top priority. But the beauty of relationship is when we're come into those relationships dead to self and alive in him. He's the true example of sacrificial love. You look more like him, you're going to have a great relationship, friendship, community. It's all going to be great. The enemy produces counterfeits through false supernatural experiences, through witchcraft, like mediums or talking to the dead, spells, living around Eureka, we've seen plenty of that. Hopefully you've not been a part of anything like that. You can deal with that if you have, all right? Go look at Leviticus uh, 19 and 20. Just read those chapters. You'll understand what this witchcraft spirit does. But it's the false supernatural. If God has sent us to be instruments and co-heirs of Christ, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, praying for healing for people, praying for supernatural things to occur, out of love for them to see the love of Christ in us, then don't you know the enemy has a counterfeit? Are all that, is all that stuff real? Is all the, you know, the different uh, the mediums and talking to the dead? Maybe, yeah, they're, they're talking to spirits. It's real. It's just a counterfeit. What is it? Oh, it lures. Because then one day it becomes death and suicidal thoughts and heaviness. That was the Lord. Okay? Jeremiah 32, 30 through 35. Let's just say, God ain't happy right now on these passages, all right? For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight from their youth. The children of Israel, Israel have done nothing but provoke me to anger by the work of their hands, declares the Lord. This city has aroused my anger and wrath from the day it was built to this day, so that I will remove it from my sight because of all evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah that they did to provoke me to anger, their kings, their officials, their priests, their prophets, yeah. and the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Yeah. They have turned their back to me and not their face. That's right. And though I have taught them persistently, they have not listened to receive instruction. They set up abominations in the house that is called by my name to defile it. They built high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hinnom to offer up their sons and daughters to Molech. Does that sound familiar? Though I did not command them, nor did it enter into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. That high place of Baal that we've offered up our sons and daughters to, what is that? It's abortion. It's sex. It's the God of Molech. Man, our, our, our culture does not want to hear that today. Why? Because sex is our God. I don't want anybody telling them what to do because they're going to be confronted with sin. None of us like that. But this is the truth of the Lord. That if we're going to do it, we need to do it His way. And there are curses upon this nation because of the choices that we've made to offer up our sons and daughters. For the God of sex, the God of mother. Our flesh gets so inflamed and desirous of what we want that we get blinded to what is good and what is right and what is of the Lord. Man. And you know, here's, here's what I want to say, even right here. With repentance, His grace is sufficient. If that's been your journey.
maybe maybe even maybe you haven't maybe not been one of them that's had an abortion or had to deal with those kinds of choices, but but maybe you've owned it as a as a mindset. It's a, it, it's okay to walk over here and repent. Amen. Yeah. And God is fully welcoming of a repentant heart. See, if we are dead to ourselves, then it's not it's no longer my body. It's not my body standing right here. It's his. And I know, I put on my mud shoes. I told you, I'm stepping off into it today. Lastly, the enemy will ultimately produce a counterfeit, which is called the false messiah. Will be, will be known as the Antichrist before Jesus comes back. It's mass deception before his return. Have we been able to see enough to know that this is pretty possible? Yes, yeah. The enemy takes a little bit of truth and then twists it to deceive as many people as possible. 2 Thessalonians 2 7 through 12 says, For the mystery of of lawlessness is already at work. We can see that even now. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. Now, there are, I've heard many theologians pontificate on what the restrainer is. My, my personal pontification on this is that it's a system of government that has been there to kind of keep things at bay. Yes, sir. And that restrainer gets removed. <laughs> In the last days. I think we can see some of that taking place. Even as we speak. Verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Who's the lawless one? The Antichrist. And the lawless one will be revealed. Whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth. And bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan. With all power and false signs and wonders. Right. Guess what? There's false signs and wonders because there's been real ones. <laughs> so if you're not even in the camp of believing the signs and wonders are for the day, hello. <laughs> something's got to be thought true before it's false. Okay? And in verse 10, with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. That's an important phrase. They refuse to. To love the truth. If we are refusing to love the truth of God over our flesh cravings, then we are going to be in this same camp right here. They refuse to love the truth and so be saved. They are going to be so deceived that they will perish. Verse 11, therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. Now, this phrase right here, God is a gentleman. He's not going to make you believe something. He wants you to choose him. And we get a window. You know, sometimes we, we have sin moments, right? And we repent. And we say, okay, Lord, yes, my heart is with you. I don't want to do these things, but I do. But I'm here. I'm with you. And that's what the grace of God is for. And that's why Jesus came. When we have just said yes to lawlessness and sin for so long, we will renounce our faith at some point. You will. Right here it says it. Because that sinning of strong delusion is if God removing his drawing you back. Because, okay. It's like who wants to be a millionaire. Go to a friend, you get all these, you get all these opportunities, and then he says, is that in the final answer? He gives us a moment. And most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we'll know when that moment is. You will. Because he's already sent people into your life that love you. And he sent them because he loves you. And he's saying, hey, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there. Turn around, turn around. The bridge is out. So therefore, God just says, okay, that's your choice. Okay. 
Verse 12. So that they may believe what is false in order that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's a huge, that's a huge thing right there. So the enemy is also referred to as the spirit of Antichrist. And he is the opposite of Christ's agenda to restore all things. That's what Jesus is coming back. He's coming back to restore all things. The Antichrist agenda is there to bring chaos and confusion and division and destruction. All under the guise of deception. To everyone spiritually. Causing them to stand in this pride that's opposing God. If the enemy can get us fighting each other and opposing the truth of God through our own fleshly desires, then this takes the attention off of him and his agenda. He's, like, he's going, he's working over here, he's going, hey, look over here, you know? Because he's getting us to fight and cause division in ourselves only to be Changing the course of history over here. Twisting it up. Mass deception will bring spiritual destruction to all who are being deceived. That's why we want to tell people about Jesus, what he's done for us. So how does he do this initially? Well, the enemy ever so slightly begins to lure us away from the word of God. With lies, fleshly cravings, it leads to us adopting, adopting mindsets that make us think our way is better. Adopting lives that feed the flesh then leads us to adopting lifestyles of sin, which then lead to a debased mind or a seared conscience, which makes it more difficult to hear and see the truth anymore. And you might ask, well, how do you know that, Paul? Well, let's go to Romans 1. Yeah, we're in Romans 1. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. See, we all know the truth. Even those that are not in Christ. Why? Because he placed that within us. Anybody that's walking in and away from Christ. That's what they're doing. They're walking away from him because he designed us to be with him. Sin is what separates us. And when we choose it, that's what we're doing. We're just walking away from him. And so we suppress the truth and we don't want to know the truth. I don't want to know abortion is wrong. I don't want to know homosexuality, homosexuality is, is wrong. I don't, want, I don't want to know all that because I like what I'm here feeling. What my flesh is craving. Verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For this, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. In verse 21, a very important phrase, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God and give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking. Became dead in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22. See if you, you hear any of this in our culture. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. Resembling mortal man, birds, animals, and creeping things. And we have idols everywhere in our culture, yes? Verse 24, here's another phrase. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity. Remember, we get a window, and he says, is that your final answer? If so, okay. Why? Because he's a gentleman. He's not going to make you. Therefore, God gave them up in their lusts, in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies and of themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God, or truth about God, for a lie. 
self-deception, right? This is why it's such an important topic for us today, because our culture is pressing in on the church. It's pressing in to our mindsets that are contrary to the Word of God. We must know what this says and guard it in our hearts. Exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves a new penalty for their error. It doesn't get any clearer than that, folks. I'm sorry. Our culture wants to try to decorate this. And I've heard so many justifications. Well, that word is not really that. Yeah, it is. They describe it. Men with men and women with women. It's not okay. And it's, it is not okay for heterosexuals to have sex out of marriage. It's not okay. We're all in the same line. It's all still sin. But we see a culture really trying to make it a community, a false community of saying, it's okay. No, it's not. And we're going to pay for it dearly. And we are paying for it. Our kids are paying for it. Even right now. And this verse 27, right, right at the very end, that phrase, receiving in themselves due penalty for their error. This isn't God's judgment on someone. It's sins. It's sin's judgment. Then when we, we will feel the attack of the enemy when we give in to sin. We will. Why? Because we're advocating who we are. We're, we've got to fight for that position and stand. When we advocate that, we're, we're stepping back into his world and he's like, hey, welcome back. Let's have a hand. Woo! And he wreaks havoc. So if he can get our mindsets into adopting something that is contrary to the word, then we are spun out waiting for trouble. Verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, and there's that phrase again, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. Evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, dis disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Man, that's a big list. Verse 32, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Again, it's not about us judging people. I just, man, it's just the word of God going, hey, sin's going to leave you this mark. If you really want to Pursue sin, okay, but you're going to be affected by this. Self-deception begins in a form of wanting flesh over truth. The truth will always oppose the flesh. So what do we do about that? We're back to repentance. We're back to that searching word. We're back to that truth. Back to the freedom of repentance. You're getting free from the stuff you've been tangled up in. All of us need it. All of us need that. Amen. You don't want the debased 
mind. Which would be a, in, in translation, it's another way of saying inverted or reversed. <laughs> or a reprobate mind means morally condemned. Or in other words, it would be dead mind spiritually. So we see this twisted, reprobate mindset in our culture. So have you ever noticed the political tactic of playing on emotions to appeal to a specific political stance? If you haven't, your eyes are closed, okay? All right? They do, they do this all day, every day, on whatever news station you can see. The spirit of witchcraft comes through manipulation, and it's alive and well. Everywhere. The media, the media propels this into our psyche on a daily basis. Which is why if you're taking in more media than you are the word, guess what you're going to adopt? So we've seen this political tactic grossly and grotesquely played out in the past week after the horrific shooting down in Uvalde, Texas. As these families are weeping over the loss of their sweet children to Political figures are dialing up their agenda and using it for their own political gain. Makes me nauseous. The enemy loves pitting us against ourselves as humanity. They love playing on our emotions and flesh. I mean, it's all counterfeit. It's all counterfeit. It's fake. Nobody politically in our mainstream culture really wants the solution here. Those that care do. Those that have are believers that have eyes to see and ears to hear, they do. But the harsh fact is that it is truly a heart issue. It's the evidence of opposition to the truth of God for years. It's, it's the enemy's deception that has led to the breakdown of the family unit that leads a young man to feel such hatred and anger and brokenness that he would shoot up a a school full of elementary school students. The young shooter has a story too. And the solution is Jesus. But culture doesn't want to hear that. Guns are not the issue. The heart and its deception is the issue. Culture has spent millions and pushing God and the truth out of every crevice of our school system and is rapidly trying to push him out of society altogether. And we wonder why all of this is happening. Somewhere in the quiet places of our sin nature, we are all capable of doing some very hurtful, disappointing things. Now we're being honest with ourselves. And sometimes we do those things. We don't like to be told we are wrong or that we are in sin. And we don't even like anything in opposition of our stance, whatever that may be, whether it's politically or doctrinally. Churches have divided over, you know, and made mountains out of molehills for decades. Right? And we have a codependent culture and society that says, I can't function if you don't agree with my choices. And if you don't agree with my choices, then you hate me and I'm going to make it against the law that you do. <laughs> yeah. See how crazy that sounds? Just all right, yeah. yeah. But that's what we're in. Yeah. We are capable of succumbing to the enemy's deception. Guess what? We are even capable of working with the enemy in deceiving ourselves. It doesn't quite sound right if we say it that way, does it? I mean, if we can't be honest with ourselves, then we're going to be deceived by the enemy. And, if, and we've just made his job really easy. Because we are really deceiving ourselves with lies that we know go against the truth of God. We probably wouldn't Say we believe the lie if we were just told it straight up, right? In its purest form. Remember our relationship scenario? Remember our screaming three-year-old rejection? <laughs> you 
If I were to tell you, you know, you really don't believe God will provide someone in your life that loves Jesus and can be even better than you could try to find, do you? I mean, we would, if somebody were to say this to us, we'd kind of scoff at that, wouldn't we not? Well, yeah, yeah, I believe God. I mean, we would be quick to kind of, but we tend to cater to the lie. And settle for someone that is not a person that should have even made the cut for consideration, much less be in a relationship with. Right. Okay. We know pornography is wrong, right? But late at night, you and the computer, and the flesh feelings of entitlement, I deserve this, really make it difficult to say no. But if you got a telemarketing call asking you to support the human trafficking of women, young girls, and even young boys, the pedophiles, you would probably hang up on them, would you not? Yes. You would probably call the police. I hope you would. But there is a lie that is believed that somehow your clicks on that website or you contributing more views to that website is not that big a deal. Like your clicks don't matter. They do. See, we deceive ourselves. And we find ways to justify the deception and sin. If we are not attuned to what the enemy is doing, we may find ourselves waking up one day wondering how in the world the enemy has gained such access to our lives and is wreaking such havoc. And in fact, we might even in that moment try to blame God. Well, God, I did this. I'm, I'm, what are you doing? I thought we were good. Huh. Rewind the tape, bro. Okay. There's, there's some issues that we need to address. Okay, here's the point. The point of this entire teaching is, is, is not to make you feel horrible or full of shame. I can't. Grace of God is sufficient for us today that are in Christ, okay? So we're not, it's not through condemnation that we're going after this, all right? It is for us to see that through Christ we have power over the enemy. He's a deceiver. He's not all powerful. His power is determined by how much you want to give him through your belief in his life. Then these lies are just stuff that's contrary to the truth. Contrary to the word of God. So, I mean, if we don't know the word of God, that would be a great place to start. We need to know it. We need to be in it. I mean, we find a, we find a way to connect with people that we love, right? They're out of our sight and we haven't seen them in a long time. You know, I've even, you know, we've lost loved ones and the longer it gets, the, you want to keep the memory of who they are and what they look like, what their voice sounded like. So you might go watch a, an old video or, a, you know, or an old picture that brings them to mind to refresh our memory. The longer that we're away from the word, the more we forget. It's just our nature. It's who we are. It's, it's humanity. That's why he says the continual renewing of our mind is so important for us to have victory over this thing called flesh. So two things. Yes, we've got to be in the word of God to know the truth. This is one of the truths that sets us free. And when we know the truth, we are fighting from a stance of victory instead of trying to obtain victory. Deception loses its power over our minds when the truth of God is revealed to our mind. That's why it's living and active. It's sharp and being two edged sword. It's, there's something that happens when you crack open the word, man. It just starts speaking to you. And that's him. It's a good place to be. Two, being a part of the body of Christ, especially deep in relationship with those who God has strategically placed 
to be that in your life. You need to know Holy Spirit is going to use those people to help you see what you cannot. We None of us can say, well, I don't need people. Wow. Really? Because deception is tricky. We've got to talk about it. We talked about this all morning. We can be deceived. And if you don't think you can, then, you know, maybe you'd like to watch this thing over again, bro. I mean, like, you know, rewind, all right? Because I think we can understand we can be deceived. It's tricky. And it usually needs another set of eyes. Because, man, we're in it. Oh, man, our flesh wants to really do this. I really want a relationship with this person. Or I'm, you know, justifying my second donut. I, I mean, whatever. You know, when, when you stop listening to those people that God has strategically placed and lovingly placed in your life, and look out, man. Look out. You're headed headlong into a wall. A spiritual wall. And these are people that will lovingly tell you and will lovingly tell you the truth no matter how difficult. Don't get mad at them. They love you. If they don't love you, then find some new friends, all right? I mean, I hope that we got some, we got some stuff here, all right? They love you. That's what they're there for, okay? If you don't have these people in your life, then you are just as vulnerable because you are only listening to you. Amen. You remember, you, you know, that person that can be easily deceived. Yeah. Right? right? <laughs> so don't play into the enemy's hand. Sign up for the enemy's team against yourself. So how does this happen? We ignore our keeps in our life. <laughs> We speak out loud statements that are 100% opposed to who God says you are, what he says you can do through him, and what he has promised for you. God never lies, and he can be 100% trusted with our life. Amen. Why don't you stand with me? Don't be deceived. And don't get mad at it. Because you... We get mad at him because we stop listening. That doesn't make any sense. Right? We get mad at him because we stop listening and are feeling the consequence of our sin. What you are feeling is simply the enemy getting all up in your business, all right? Because you're choosing flesh over spirit. Learn to hear a subtle voice. Those quiet Holy Spirit red flags. And obey his voice instead of flesh voice today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just come before you today. We thank you so much for the truth of your word. We thank you for its rock solid foundation. That there is no other truth apart from you. You are the truth. You're the only truth. And you're the only way. So, Lord, we just ask that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear that today. And grace and mercy that you have paid the penalty of that sin. If we will just repent, if we will turn from that, do a 180 from that old person and say yes to you. You will give us those eyes to see. You will give us those ears to hear. You will forgive us of our sin. You will forgive us of our pride that says, I got to figure it out better than you, God. Oh, God, help us today. We repent. We repent of pride. We renounce you, spirit of pride. You have to go. Holy Spirit, fill us right now with humility. Fill us with your spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, your gentleness, self control. It's only by your power that we can walk in it. So, Lord, we submit to you today. Ask that you just continue changing us, molding us, and shaping us into who you want us to be. 
we're done doing it our way, we just say, I want your way, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. If that's you today, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear you to come forward. Let's just pray for you today. Well, we'll have our prayer team up here and available right after service just to pray for you and uh, solidify those benchmark moments. That's what, you know, there's nothing magical about coming forward, but there's something, a, a marker for you that you remember this day, this commitment to the Lord that said, yes, on this day, this day it changed. So I pray for you today. If you would, just come forward and pray today with us. We'd love to help you and just be able to uh, walk with you today. Thank you so much for being here. And I appreciate each and every one of you. And uh, everybody stay safe this weekend and walk in the victory of the Lord. Uh, enjoy your families. Enjoy your friends. And uh, enjoy the Lord being a part of that. Find ways. Just listen to the Spirit's voice. Don't get too far off into your own thing. And invite Him into it. Right? Just invite Him in. And see if He'll see what He does. He may open up a spiritual conversation with a family member you didn't even think. Could even say the name of Jesus. All right? I'll let you decide who that is in your family. All right? Just open the opportunity. Right? Invite Him in. All right. I'll pray and we'll be dismissed. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for speaking. Lord, we ask that you would just use this body, Lord, this, this body, this fellowship of believers, such a sweet fellowship of folks, Lord. Oh, we've heard a tough message today, but Lord, we, we need to realign with you today and walk in you today. And so, Lord, we want to be submitted to you. We want to be fully and completely devoted to your truth today. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for mercy. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys have a great rest of your weekend. Bless you.